A Frog in Boiling Water by Dallas Woodburn 3642 Maplewood Drive is a three-story flagstone house with a gabled roof and four-car garage nestled deep within the protective arms of Red Fern Ranch, which is not a ranch at all, but rather a gated community in a northern California suburb not much nuanced by crime to begin with. In this neighborhood, the house is preen. Windows sparkle. The sidewalks are dutifully swept. The curbs are free of debris. Parked cars do not clutter the streets. If one's lawn ventures into unkempt neglect, the Homeowners Association sends a firm but gentle reminder by way of a firm but gentle fine. At 3642 Maplewood Drive, gardeners come every Wednesday morning to trim the hedges, mow the lawn, rake the leaves. A family lives here. A mother, a father, a son. I am born at 3642 Maplewood Drive at 8.53 p.m. on a Friday night. Not a soul in Redfern Ranch knows about me. It is a dry, still night, static electricity palpable in the air. I am born in the attic. On this Friday night, minutes after my birth, an argument simmers in the ornately tiled kitchen. The son, Jason, a high school senior admitted to Berkeley next fall, wants to go out with his friends, but his mother is adamantly against him going anywhere. I just have a feeling, she says. A bad feeling. I can't explain it. Jason looks down at the granite countertop, silently runs his finger along the grout between the tiles. Please, honey, stay here tonight, will you? Safe and sound? I'll be safe, Mom. I promise. Honey, I won't even be out that late. The father stamps into the kitchen and bangs cabinets, opening and closing them at random. He settles on a bag of trail mix, which he pours into his palm. Listen to your mother, he says, using his no-arguing voice. I promise I won't be out late. Jason, what have we talked about? The son sighs. Fine, I'll be a loser with no social life. The mother's face relaxes. She had felt tears welling up inside her, but she was able to tamp them down before an outburst overtook all thought. She smiles gratefully at George, reaches over, and strokes Jason's hair. For a few moments, he stands there and lets her. Thank you, she says, to George, to Jason, to them both. It is 9.02 p.m. We cannot choose the circumstances in which we are born. Once I am sparked to life, a single thought drives my existence. Consume. All I know is, I am ravenous. I cannot stop myself. Jason ducks away from his mother and heads up to his bedroom. There's a movie on HBO tonight you might like, his father calls after him. Some apocalypse action movie. No response other than the clomping of Jason's tennis shoes on the stairs. George looks at Marie and shrugs. She shrugs in return, giving him a playful smile before turning away, her attention snagged by the sinkful of dirty dishes. She is wearing a long skirt that clings to her hips. Her hair, dyed a dark brown, gleams in the warm kitchen light. George is swept by the feeling of how it used to be, the two of them, together, apart from everyone else. It is this feeling that spurs him across the kitchen, wiping the peanut crumbs off his palms. Marie is bent over the big kitchen sink, arms in sudsy water, rinsing pasta sauce off dinner plates and dressing out of salad bowls. 
George watches her shadowy reflection in the darkened kitchen window, her eyes cast downward, absorbed in her task. The steamy water fills the sink, a continuous rushing sound. He stands behind her, inching closer, closer, then he's pressed to her, wrapping his arms around her waist, kissing her soft neck. She flinches, her body stiffening. George pulls away. She turns off the water and flicks her hands once, twice, three times. When she turns, finally, her expression reminds George of a frightened animal, of the squirrel they found one summer, trapped in the attic, desperate to find a way out. I'm sorry, she says. It's just, I've told you, it's hard for me right now being touched. George takes another step away from her. He runs his hand over his thinning hair, back, forward, back. It's not you, she says. It's not anything to do with you. It feels that way, though. It's not, I swear. I love you. I'm just, I'm just not there yet. But will you ever get there? George wants to ask. Will you ever be my wife again? Eight months since they've made love. Two months since her last breakdown, when the doctor put her on that new medication. It's just that you've seemed better lately, he says. I thought I could kiss you without frightening you away. It's not you, George. I guess I was mistaken. Sorry. He wraps his knuckles twice on the countertop. His smile is forced, worse than a frown. I'll be upstairs in my study. He says. He works as a financial planner for small businesses. Got some emails to send. Marie nods and turns back to the dishes. The water is scalding, but she doesn't turn it colder. She watches her hands scrubbing the delicate china. She watches them as if they are someone else's hands. Her skin is a bright pink. Maybe. Maybe, she thinks. Maybe tonight. Maybe I can try to stand it. It is 9.14 p.m. Once you are alive, it is impossible to know what it was like before life. Yet, I can taste memories all around me. This cluttered attic is drowning in memories. Christmas tinsel caught around a popsicle stick ornament a Kodak Instamatic with a half roll of unused film inside, a child's rocking chair carved from redwood, a delicacy. I devour the memories, and then they disappear, and I am left famished, raging for more. I am suffocating. I need oxygen. I need to breathe. Jason flops backwards onto his bed, feeling suffocated in the emptiness of his bedroom, the vast hardwood floors stretching around him like a wasteland. He wants to be in a small room crowded with noise and people. He wants a stranger to spill a drink on his shoes. He wants a girl to sob on his shoulder. He wants to dance in the crushing, sweaty heart of a San Francisco club. He wants to stumble out onto a darkened street and have no idea where he is, what time it is, or how he got there, and not care. He wants to be reckless, to dare life. Come on, send me the best you've got. I'm ready. His cell phone buzzes. Jason ignores it, knowing it's Danny or Steve or Brendan, one of the guys, wanting to know what time he'll be there tonight. If their parents give them a hard time about going out, they go anyway. Or they sneak out later. Or they lie about where they're going. Jason has never been able to lie. His face burns and his words run together. And it's gotten worse since his mother's last episode. She's always been an anxious person. Fluttery and hands ringy, moved to tears by burnt breakfast toast. But... Jason never thought he would see her like that, curled on a ball on the floor of her walk-in closet, her eyes huge and far away, 
rocking back and forth, back and forth in a slow, terrifying, mechanical way. The doctors later referred to it as a panic attack, and she has been back to normal since then, her medication living calmly in the kitchen cupboard alongside the multivitamins and Tums. But Jason can't shake the image of her, wild-eyed and quivering, and he worries that any little thing could send her reeling back to that dark place. And what if the next time she doesn't recover? What if her small yellow pills no longer work? What then? His phone buzzes again. Jason pushes himself off his bed and reaches for it. Brendan. So what time do you want me to pick you up? I don't know, Jason says. I don't know if I'm going. Dude, don't bail out now. You always bail. It's just, you know how strict my parents are. So sneak out. It's not a big deal. Listen, I'll pick you up at the corner across from the movie theater. I'll try. Quit this trying bullshit. Just be there at 10, okay? Your parents will be asleep anyway. They will never know the difference. Better make it 10.30, Jason says. Sure, 10.30, but seriously, don't bail on me, alright? I'm doing this for you. I know. Jason's social standing has nosedived in the past few months. He's declined so many invitations that he's fading into anonymity. Brendan, his best friend since 6th grade, confided that people think he's stuck up about getting into Berkeley. Brendan's a good friend. He wants to help. Thanks, man, Jason adds, feeling a surge of gratitude. I'll be there. But Brendan's already hung up. I'm half an hour old, working my way through the boxes of old EPs, Halloween costumes, baby clothes. The life-size papier-mâché sculpture Jason made of Abraham Lincoln in 6th grade. The chest of wool sweaters no one has worn since the Reagan years. Mothballed and delicious. Before, when Marie heard the word breakdown, she associated it with a sudden shift. Something triggered, like a twig stepped on by a heavy boot, snapped cleanly in two. Before, whole. After, broken. But Marie's breakdown was not like that. For her, the breakdown was something that built over a matter of days and weeks and months, a gradually increasing sense of claustrophobia compounded by guilt that she was feeling anything but gratitude for her life. Because Marie knew she had much to be grateful for. A loving husband a good son, a beautiful home in a safe neighborhood, lunches with friends at the country club, and volunteer work at the library. She never worried about money. She and George rarely argued. She had a life people yearned for and envied, an easy life. Maybe, she thought at first, her anxiety stemmed from Jason. The knowledge that he would be leaving them soon, moving out of the house and off to college, away to the next stage of his life, independent from them. He would not need her any longer. She felt purposeless, restless, and part of it was related to Jason, yes. But if she was honest with herself, it had been a while since he needed her, really needed her. Moving out was the final step of a process long begun. As the weeks dragged on, the feeling within her expanded, and it was bigger than Jason bigger than George, bigger than menopause or the onset of winter, the bare-limbed trees like ghosts in the yard. She went for long walks through the neighborhood, wanting to just keep walking, away, away, away from it all, wanting to burn everything down and start again. Renewal in having nothing, freedom in the ashes of what used to be. Marie heard once that if you put a frog in a pot of water that is ever so slowly brought to boil, the frog will not notice the increase in temperature, and it will be boiled alive without even trying to leap from the pot. Her breakdown happened when she noticed. Her breakdown was an attempt at a leap. I bide my time, keeping quiet 
gaining ground without much notice. It is 9.32 p.m. Marie lifts her knuckle to Jason's bedroom and tentatively knocks. Come in. The door winds as she opens it. Jason is flopped back on his bed, spiral notebook on his bent knees, the bedside lamp blazing a halo of light on his face. What are you working on? She asks from the doorway. Homework? Thought I'd get something done since I'm not going anywhere. Sometimes, when she looks at her son, Marie is amazed by how strange he seems to her. How unknowable. For nine long months, he grew inside her. She was his everything. And now, now he humors her, resents her. Now they are strangers who just happen to live under the same roof. Thank you for staying in tonight, she says. It's no big deal. I just have a bad feeling, a mother's intuition. I know you think I'm crazy. Marie trails off, but Jason doesn't respond. She waits a moment more, then says, I'm going over to Safeway to get groceries for the week. You're going now? Jason sits up. Is the store even open this late? Till 11. I hate to deal with the crowds. How long will you be gone? Not long. Anything you want me to get you? Jason leans back on his pillow. Mountain Dew. Okay, Marie says not even putting up a fight about the amount of sugar or chemicals in that drink, his favorite since he was a boy. She understands that Jason is bargaining with her. He is staying home tonight, and she is buying him Mountain Dew. She can do that. I love you, she says, and shuts the door before he can decline to say it back. I am spurred onward by desire, not love, need, not want, there is a difference. I do not love anything. I do not know what it means to be selfless. Yet, there is honor in my pursuit. I am exactly where I am supposed to be, doing exactly what I am supposed to do. Consumption is my life's purpose. It must be. If not, why would it be such an irrepressible urge within me? George is down the hall in his study, doing online Sudoku. Marie comes in without knocking. I'm going to the store, she says. Ever since her last breakdown, she's been going to the store late at night when no one else is there. George thought it would be good for them to shop together, or for her to go during the day or evening like everyone else when she would have a chance to run into friends. He hates to see her withdrawing from the world like this. So scared so on edge. But her doctor, a thick-haired, pompous wearer of sweater vests who George does not trust, sided with Marie, saying it would be better for her to avoid crowds and, quote, anxiety-inducing situations, unquote. Okay, George says now, not looking up from his computer screen. Drive safe. I will. See you in a while. I'll probably be asleep when you get back. I'm thinking of hitting the sack soon. Oh, okay then. The hurt on her face is what George wanted, yet it brings him no satisfaction. Is this what they've come to? Round after round of bruised feelings and subtle barbs. It's been a long week, he adds. Marie nods, then leaves, shutting the door behind her. George closes Sudoku and opens his favorite porn site. It is 9.43 p.m. I can detect life in the layers of house below me, creaking the floorboards, rattling the pipes. But they do not frighten me. They have no idea I am here, no idea how strong I am becoming with every passing second. Somewhere in the attic is a box that has not been opened in 26 years. Inside rests a wedding dress, carefully folded and wrapped in tissue paper. It is the last thing I find before everything comes crashing down. Jason stares at his bedroom ceiling, wondering what he'll tell his parents if he gets caught tonight. 
George watches the pixelated, gyrating blondes trying to fight away the image of his wife's timid, broken eyes. Marie climbs into her Lexus with her reusable grocery bags and backs down the driveway, thinking how monstrous the house looks tonight, like a dark palace against a blue-black sky, like something out of a grim fairy tale. It is 9.53 p.m. In the ensuing weeks, at George and Jason's funerals, people will try to console Marie with words, facts, scientific terms. It was an electrical fire. It started in the attic. There is no way anyone could have known. It was a slow-burning, smoldering nightmare. No warning, no smoke. The ceiling just collapsed, and by then it was too late. Nobody's fault. Just one of those bizarre freak accidents. But Marie does not believe and accidents. Until the day she dies, June 16th, four years later, her Lexus colliding head-on into a tree, she is convinced that the fire is her fault. She is the reason it came into being. She is the one who left, who abandoned it all, everything, to burn. It is 10.36 p.m. on Friday night. The back of Marie's Lexus bulges with groceries. She can see the smoke from all the way down Maplewood Drive. She presses her foot to the gas pedal, hurrying, hurrying, her heartbeat a blur of thumping, as if a part of her knows what she will find. Fire trucks, an ambulance, neighbors crowding the street, the choking smell of soot and ashes. 3642 Maplewood Drive, engulfed in flames. Our lives are short. That is the nature of any existence. I know I will die before I am ready. But then again, won't we all? The men lift their hoses and gun me down. Dallas Woodburn a recent Steinbeck Fellow in creative writing, has published fiction and nonfiction in Modern Loss, Fourth River, The Nashville Review, The Los Angeles Times, North Dakota Quarterly, and Monkey Bicycle, among many others. A three-time Pushcart Prize nominee, she won first place in the International Glass Woman Prize and second place in the American Fiction Prize. Her short story collection was a finalist for the Flannery O'Connor Award for Short Fiction, the Augury Book Prose Award, and the Horatio Nelson Fiction Prize. She is the founder of Write On Books, an organization that empowers young people through reading and writing endeavors. Learn more at www.writeonbooks.org. The music in this story is by Sealand. You can find more of their work including their album Dark Days at S-E-A-L-A-N-D dot bandcamp dot com.